pastor here, and I get the pleasure of talking to you today about the fear of man. Uh, this is just a, a theme and a word that's kind of just been on my heart the last few weeks, and so I, I um, put a pen to paper and just scribbled out everything I could think of and everything that the God showed me. And it's kind of like, you ever buy a new car or you get a car that's new, maybe new to you, and then you drive around town and then all of a sudden you notice every person who has the same car that you have, you know? So I kind of feel like that's where my seasons go with the Lord, where he'll put a word just, you know, on the forefront for me. And then every time I read, anytime, like just when the Lord like speaks, it almost always just, it falls under the same umbrella. Like, dude, you got a RAV4 also, you know, I I got like, we're just honed in. Uh, So that's, that's the word today. So we'll just, let me read this verse and then we'll pray. It's Matthew 22. It says, Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. So God, I I thank you for what you're doing today. I thank you for being a, a, a good leader and a good father, for knowing what we need, for giving good gifts, for speaking. You are a God who speaks, a God who heals. And so we just give you all of our attention this morning, and we pray, amen. Okay, well, there um. I got this. I got this heavenly conviction the other day, where I, I was just thinking about my time with the Lord, and I felt the Lord just ask me if I approached His Word with the same amount of excitement and enthusiasm as I do a worship set. Do I approach sitting down to read with the same level of excitement that I do like when I go to a conference? Or if my super favorite, most awesome pastor teacher ever were to sit down, right? Like you get the idea, right? Like his word, his word, like I should have that level of excitement. I, sh- I just should, I should. It, it, it's, it's life to me, it's life giving. It is really changed. Like I cannot tell you how many times I've sat down to read And words have just jumped off the page. That was like, it was exactly what I needed. It was comforting. It was whatever. It also can correct and convict. (laughs) Uh, It can definitely correct. I feel like most of the time that I really need a word, I need a word because I'm in the wrong. And then when I get in front of the Lord, he'll show me how and why I'm wrong. And (laughs) And it's an unpopular thought, but like, honestly, I... Uh, I saw a quote, Pastor Landon shot, he pastors a church in Texas, and, and he said, um, when wise people read scripture and it's different than how they feel, they assume that they're wrong. Just let that weigh on you this morning. Can we just assume that we're wrong? Amen. <laughs> he gets it. Amen. I know. It's super early. It's 10, 10 on a Sunday. I totally feel you. But like, I promise you, <laughs> I promise you that like, if we approach the Bible in any other way, in any other fashion, we're not going to give God room to correct. Right. And so instead we're, there's some other lens and like, I need to be corrected because like, I promise that there are things that are very convincing. There is a lie in the world that will trap you and trick you. And if you're not careful, you'll never even know. And you'll wind up in a situation that you weren't supposed to be in, in the first place. And like, had we have really been adamant people of the word, and allowed God to speak to us through what he, like, what he says, like, it could have been totally different. And it's not like, oh, shame on you, you missed it. No, it's like, you have a gift, and it's right here. It's right here. You have a gift for you, for you. And it's not like, have you ever ever been in a situation where people, they'll say something funny, and they'll be like, they'll tag it and attribute it to the Holy Spirit, so then you can't argue them? You know, they'd be like, oh, some weird off-base thing. Holy Spirit told me. And it's like you just stamp it like that so then nobody can, like, correct you, right? Well, you can't, you can't twist the word like that. The word will read you. you. Find a man of God and try to lie to him, right? So I, we're going to look at Saul and Samuel today. And I, I just want you to see that theme. I want you to see the idea of the fear of man. 
Okay, and I'll give you my definition of what that means. It's a desire to please God, or sorry, it's a desire to please people or self more than God. So there's usually some kind of proud, like lustful spirit attached to it. It actually becomes an idol. And the thing that's the most tricky about it is that it feels very sneaky because it doesn't always start off as some full grown thing. And especially, you know, look at, just look at the world right now. Do I need to pick a topic? <laughs> serious, like, like seriously, it's, it, it, there's, there's a line that's getting drawn in the sand. And if we're not careful, if we're not allowing God to renew our minds, like it'll, it'll mess you up. So, all right, fear God, self-reliance. In my opinion, this is one of the greatest threats to the church right now. There's a couple of them, but I think one of the big ones is a fear of man and self-reliance. <clears throat> and we'll, we'll touch on that. But I want to I wanna show you why, why I believe that. It's 1 John 2, verse 15. It says, Do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. So, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. This is a super tough word, and I understand that, but it's, it's one that actually will bring freedom in your life. It will bring freedom in your life, right? And so, what happens is, we're going to look at here Matthew 4. You know the story where Jesus, Holy Spirit, led him into the wilderness, fasted 40 days, Right? Satan comes and he comes to tempt him. But I want to put that framework around it. Look at what he tempts him with, how he tries to tempt him, and what Jesus does to respond. So Matthew 4, I'm just going to read through 1 to 10, and then we'll just tag back. I just want you to see this pattern so that when we do look at Saul, it's the only thing you see. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up to the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest your foot lest you dash your foot against the stone. And Jesus said to him, it is written again, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Again, the devil took him up into exceedingly the high place and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. And then Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only you shall serve. This is the same way that Satan tries to get us. If he goes after Jesus in this manner, he will go after you in the same manner, right? And, and so verses 3 to 4, Jesus is hungry, and he tempts him with the lust of the flesh. You want to eat? You want to eat? You, are you hungry? Here's some food. 5 to 7, he, he offers, uh, it, it's the pride of life. You know, I basically interpret it as him saying like, hey, you know, like, if you're really Jesus, you jump off here. Angels, it says that they're going to come lift you up, you know, like do it, prove it, show me who you are. And 8 through 10, it's the lust of the eyes, right? And Satan says, look at all this. You can have this. This could all be yours. I, I just want to point out that two of these verses, Satan challenged his identity as a son. He challenged his identity as a son. And all three of them, Jesus responded by saying what the word had to say. Okay, so I just, I just want, I'm just saying that like, this is real and you're not exempt. And if the word that you get is JD for 30 minutes on a Sunday morning, the other six days of the week, right, you're weaponless and you're disarmed. You're disarmed. I'm hungry sometimes. 
<laughs> I'm proud sometimes. I lost sometimes. It's true. It is real, right? And so the ability to counter that by having a heavenly perspective is something that you can rest and build your entire life on. So here we go. Proverbs 29. It says, the fear of man, it brings a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. So please understand, this is a snare. It's not, I mean, like, sure, sometimes it could be some huge, crazy, obvious thing, but I don't believe it starts out that way, not all the time. I don't believe it's just, will catch your attention right off the rip. Maybe if you're super discerning, you'll catch it all the time, right? But I feel like it starts small. Right? And the truth is, is that we obey the thing that we fear the most. That's how it works. You will obey the thing that you fear the most. And if it's not God, it's something else. Right? So think about, just think about previous things that we've talked about here. Unforgiveness. Right? It, generally, it's something that'll grow. Right? Whatever it is. Whatever it is, it'll grow. So you just need to be on the lookout, and you need, it's, it's Psalm 139, right? You pray the prayer, and, and the NLT version says it really good. It says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you. When is the last time you asked God to put his finger on the part of you that didn't look like him? It's rhetorical. Don't answer. But you know. I know. Right? And, and so... Please understand that, like, the reason this is so important to me is, is because I'm just sober-minded about it. Like, I'm not mad in any capacity. I'm not some angry dude who's like, ah, the church needs it. No, 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 no. No, I'm sober. Because if we don't get this, then you're going to get stuck in the world. You're going to look like Saul. And it's going to happen, you know, over the course of however long, right? If you really want to impress me, run hard for the Lord for 38 years. <laughs> right? And when we sit down to have lunch, have something new, fresh, you can cry, weeping over pastors or <laughs> passages. You should weep over pastors too, I guess. <laughs> but it, it's so, yeah, it's so necessary. So it's a trap. It's a snare. If you trust in the Lord, you will be safe. So let's look at Saul. I, I want to point this out because the story of Saul's life is pretty well known. Right? But, but I just want to put my finger on parts of it that, um, that really stick out to me. So here's what I'm going to do. I, I'm, you can download my notes. I have a bajillion scriptures in here. But for the sake of it, let me just like give you some, give you some insight. So Saul is the first king. Samuel is the judge. Samuel is basically, he's a picture of the Holy Spirit. He's speaking on behalf of the Lord, right? And, and so... What happens is, is the people decide that they want to be like every other nation and they want a king, right? And so like, yeah, you probably know that. Pastor Lee, Lee Cummings, when we were at our, our conference a couple weeks ago, he, he pointed out that when Samuel anointed Saul, he used a flask, which is man-made. And when he anointed David, he used a horn, which is not made by man. Right? And I just thought, like, man, that's so good. Like, that can only be revealed to you by spending time with God and asking his word to jump off pages, right? So, like, have you heard this story before? Yes. If you go home and read these passages, God will show you things that you did not know. <laughs> it's not dry. You never graduate from like, oh, I can skip 1 Samuel 8 to 16. God, I don't need it anymore. <laughs> give me the prophets. Give me the hard stuff. Like, no, no, no. You need all of it. We need all of it. I need every single word in this book. So, so here's 1 Samuel 8. I'll just, we'll just skim it. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. And they said to him, look, you are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. Now, so remember fear of man. So do you see elevating self above God's desire? We don't want what you gave us. We want a king like everyone else. Do you see the lust of the eyes? We're checking out other nations, and we like what they have more, even though you give good gifts. Do you see the lust of the flesh? Do you see it? It's all over the place. It's rampant. A great indicator that you are not operating in the fear of the Lord is you want. 
Psalm 23. Anytime you catch yourself wanting, hit the brakes for just one moment and sit back and ask the Lord, like, why do I want this? Is this you? Am I just desiring something in my own strength? Right? Because, because, (laughs) because you need to. (laughs) Because you need to, right? I, I just, the other day, parenting is really hard. (laughs) <laughs> Amen, Jamie. Uh, parenting's really hard. And, and so get this. So I wanted to take my own advice very seriously because sometimes I just feel off, you know? I just feel off. And I don't always understand what's happening until the Lord points it out. I just kind of feel like something's wonky. I, I don't really know why. And so I just ask him, like, point out anything in my heart that offends you and show me what is going on. And so... I have a 13-year-old. His name is Aiden. He is the sweetest boy. I'm sure you've seen him run around here. He's an awesome dude, right? And um, does anybody ever just want to control anything and everything that you can? Like, okay. (laughs) So it's not just me. Good. So, you know, he's a 13-year-old boy, and 13-year-old boys do 13-year-old boy things, so what I'm saying is, shocker, he's not perfect, right? <laughs> yeah, first perfect person, raise your hand. No one. Okay, cool. So, <laughs> so I found myself getting frustrated and trying to clamp down, like, the way that we lead our home. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, oh, well, obviously this deserves a consequence or this reaction deserves a reaction or whatever. Like, I can't just do nothing, right? And, and so I sat down to pray about it, and I was reading through just the life of Saul, and the Lord actually pointed out that I was proud, <laughs> and I was operating in a fear of man because what I was trying to do was to control every environment of his life and produce a freedom. I was trying to be his God by controlling him to find freedom by my rules, my set, <laughs> what I say, and if I do it well enough, then you'll get set free, right? That's crazy. And it's not fun to, like, just stand here and be like, hey, listen to how I got it wrong. Um, The Lord has no grandkids. They're all his kids. He can actually parent, convict, train, all of it, much better than I can. I'm actually harming Aiden by trying to control every single, like he could possibly grow up and like despise religion because in the man of God, I've made myself a God and tried to control his whole dang life, right? (laughs) Yeah, come on. It's true. It's quiet in here. It's all good. You know I'm right. (laughs) You know I'm right. And if it's not like, if you don't have kids, we do it with work. We do relationships, yeah. Marry the first person you date. <laughs> maybe, maybe, but like for real, like I'm not kidding. Like, w- because we don't allow the Lord to show us that possibly, maybe, just maybe, it might be our flesh desiring something, we'll just make decisions and leave God off the table. It's true. And, and, and it's, that's why it's such a snare. Because you, you might not even realize it. You might not even talk to him about it right? It it goes for so many things. It's like subconsciously we will tithe because we like the idea of our money being blessed, but we won't submit to authority or find a mentor or confess sin because we don't necessarily feel comfortable with men. And your flesh will never produce freedom, not heavenly freedom. The principle of fearing the Lord and giving him the firsts of everything is that fully submitted, fully yoked heart, fully surrendered. We tapped into that this morning during worship. That, that's where freedom comes. That's when you really give God the opportunity to shine as God. When you really give him the opportunity to show that he does give good gifts and he is a good father and he actually does know what's best for you and your kids and your job and your money and your neighbors, whatever the thing is, he knows. He knows. He's a good father. Okay, so, (laughs) so Saul, he's a, he, he's not even king yet. Uh, He, he got chosen. It says that he was a handsome, handsome man, head and shoulders taller than anyone else. And so obviously, 
it goes to show you that sometimes we pick things based on how good they look. Look at the garden. It looked good. It looked good. Look at your job. Those benefits are good. Those benefits are really good. I like the money. I like the paycheck. Right? But the atmosphere will kill you. <laughs> right? It's so true. So, okay, so we picked this king. And I personally believe that Samuel, Samuel gave Saul multiple opportunities to like get it right. He gave him multiple opportunities to get it right. And so I cannot read through, just read 1 Samuel like 8 through 16. But Samuel gives him instructions. Saul, he, he, he prophesies. It says that God gave him a new heart. And so I really do believe that like at one point in his life early on, like he really felt the Lord. Like he really felt the Lord. He, he totally, totally knew that God was real. Like I, I don't think that he was just faking it. You know, I, I feel like he really did have an encounter with God. It, the Bible says that he did. So therefore I believe it. Uh, and so he, he, you can see that he missed the mark, right? So afterwards he missed the mark. He was supposed to wait for Samuel to come before, before they went to battle. And the period of time passed and he looked around and he saw, you know, other armies starting to close in and, and Samuel wasn't around. So he made the sacrifice on his own. And sure enough, as soon as he did, who came walking up the other way? Saul did, or Samuel did. Uh, Samuel gave him instructions to take out uh, the, uh, the Amok, ugh, King Agag, King Agag. And he was supposed to destroy everything beyond, like you could not see anything left. He was supposed to desolate the village, the town, kill everyone, kill everything, all that noise. And he saw, looked, saved the nicest of the things, right? He didn't kill all of it. He didn't do what he was supposed to, right? And he saved the nicest ones and tried to offer them as a sacrifice and lie to Samuel about it. That's why I said, you know, lying to a man of God is never a good idea. So, so I just want to highlight this one verse. You see him just have this kind of waffling career, right, as the, the person chose to, to be king. And Samuel... Samuel gives him warnings several times. He gives the people warnings several times. And we get towards the end of Saul's kingship. And this is what he says. Let me find it. It's 1 Samuel 15, 24. So Samuel gets done rebuking Saul, and listen to what Saul says, verse 24. Then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord in your works, because I feared the people and I obeyed their voice. I feared the people and I obeyed their voice. Like, I couldn't even imagine being king and seeing the Lord produce victories, testimonies, right? Where, like, I couldn't imagine, I've never been to war. Uh, I just couldn't imagine to walk away from that, like, unchanged. You know what I'm saying? Like, to just, I couldn't imagine. But it's so strong, if we're not proactive with it, it'll get you. So let me just, like, give you this word. Partial obedience is disobedience. It's not obedience. Saul dressed it up the nicest he could, tried to, to make it look pretty, right? But at the end of the day, he was disobedient. He was disobedient. And, and fortunately, we have a God who's approachable. He's not a mad, mad, unapproachable God who's angry, right? Like the spirit and the bride say, come. He's a father, like the prodigal father, just watching watching for you to come. He's, he's not, not mad at you. The Bible says that the righteous will rise seven times, right? So like, if you got it wrong, if right now I'm talking and there's a part in you that's like, oh my gosh, like I am just gunning for this promotion. I've never prayed or whatever it is, right? I'm forcing my kids, um, you know, whatever. Just approach him. 
There's a verse, it's Matthew 13, and most people read this as us finding God, but it's actually, um, it's about God finding us. Um, and I've taught it that way before and got corrected by it. And like, thank goodness that there were actually people in my life who would sit me down and be like, hey, read it again. I love you. Just read it again. Read it again. All the way through. <laughs> All the way through. So when you read through it, you actually see this idea of like, this is the way that the Lord looks when he sees you. Every, every single one of you. Every single one of you. Uh, Matthew 13, look at it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid, and the joy over it he goes, and for joy over it he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. That's you. That is each of you. He desires you. He desires you. So, like, yo, you can get it wrong. You are gonna get it wrong probably before you get home <laughs> sometimes, right? But he's approachable. He's approachable. <clears throat> okay, let's do this. The Bible's full of stories of people who have tried to do things on their own. So it's not like this empty camp where, like, you know, that one person did it. Like, it happens a lot. Aaron makes the golden calf when Moses took too long in the mountain. Like, you probably know that story. It's in Exodus 32. Solomon, I don't know why I always think about this. Solomon, <clears throat> he gets warned before he takes over. Uh, make sure you follow and obey the decrees of the Lord all your life, and you will be successful. Make sure you follow the, obey, the decrees. Just You see it just over and over and over, copy-paste, copy-paste, copy-paste. And then he, he becomes king, and the first thing he does is he marries, marries Pharaoh's wife for peace. First thing he does, right? It's like, I just think about that. Damas, uh, if, if you look at Philemon 1, 24, we see Damas as he is one of the people who is walking with Paul, right? Helping, assisting in the spread of the gospel, like hands and feet, like he was with them, going out with them. And, and you fast forward to 2 Timothy 4. Paul's writing and he says, for Damas has forsaken me. Look at the next phrase. Having loved this present world. He was with Paul, right? So like pick your favorite pastor, whoever they are, who's super anointed and whatever. Walk around with them for a long time, watch them heal people, give awesome messages, whatever. And then picture yourself in 10 years, not saved, living because you love the world, right? Like if it happens to Dame, like we're not, no, there's one answer and it's God. It's his word. It's getting before him. Right? So, like, I'm going to be the dude who's like, hey, just make sure that we're awake. Just make sure we're awake. I, was, I, I said this this morning to a couple of people. If there's 10 people in a room and it's totally dark and there's no doors, no windows, how much light do you need for it to be the predominant source in that room? Just a little. Just a little is the answer. As opposed to, like, nobody saying anything or anything, right? Like, you guys, God has given us a gift. He's given us his Holy Spirit. He's giving us, like, more than what we need to not only be firmly planted, rooted, growing fruit that, that remains, but also to affect the world around us, yeah. not be affected by the world around us. There's a lot of debates happening right now. You guys see that? Anybody, anybody know what I'm talking about? Anybody see any people debating anywhere? <laughs> it's all over the place, right? It, it, it's everywhere. You can't get away from it, right? And we have the ace up our sleeve, right? And, and so fear of man is going to keep you quiet, saying nothing to no one, Right? Pick the thing. Pick the thing. What's the thing that you're the most uncomfortable with? Abortion? Race stuff? Police? Just pick it. Homosexuality in our schools? Pick the thing. What happens if nobody says anything? What happens if no one says anything? Right? Obviously, you need to speak truth and love, but we can't just avoid it. You can't just avoid it. Right? 
there are lofty arguments that make sense. And if you give in to them for too long, they might change you. It's true. It, it might get to you. You listen to something for too long, all of a sudden it starts to sound right. So I want to offer something different. <laughs> I want to offer something different. Um, might I suggest that we could be people who just walk in the spirit, who really affect every single person that we come in contact with, who aren't affected by the world in any capacity, who could walk and be an unblemished bride at that day, right? So here's, here's my keys for you. These are really my keys for me, but it's something that I try to be really, like I try to be a stickler on, I'm not saying that I get it right 100% of the time, but I do know that it's something that I need to be mindful of, and it's something like, like, put your hand to the plow and don't look back. Just get rid of anything that's in the way. All of the choices, just get rid of it, because it's everywhere, and it feels like casual scrolling. It feels like casual TV watching, but look at the subliminal messages. In Syria, oh, oh, am I that guy? Yes. Yes, I am, because I care about your soul. It's everywhere. And it's, it's, not, just, it's not just casual anymore. It's increasing, and it's rampant. And you are called to be light, and not just, like, wiggle your way to the finish line. So look at this. Psalm 5. This is, this is, I've just been reading this one sentence. O oh Lord, in the morning you hear my voice, and in the morning I prepare a sacrifice for you and watch. Do you prepare a sacrifice for the Lord in the morning? Do you bring him an offering in the morning? Do you get before him and offer something, something to give him? Psalm 1, it says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. Are we doing that? Are we doing that? Do you meditate? Do you take delight in it? Do you take delight in the fact that when you read the Bible, sometimes it asks you to change? Ryan opened with Psalm 27 this morning. I'm just going to read it again. I want to highlight the very last sentence. It says, One thing I have desired of the Lord, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. And then here's, here's the part I want you to catch. To behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Do you know that you can ask God questions? That you can sit and look at him Look at how beautiful he is and then ask him, hey, what's your heart on abortion? What's your heart about calling people by their pronouns? What's your heart for my city? It affects everybody. Everybody knows somebody who struggles with this stuff, who's confused. Maybe they hate you because they don't want anything to do with it. Right? You can ask of God. You can ask him. So let's do this. <clears throat> I want to end with Corinthians, or no, Colossians. I think that they hit this verse last week too. I'm going to start in two and I'm going to read all the way through three. He says, therefore, if you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, why as though living in the world do you subject yourself to regulations? Do not touch, do not taste, do not handle, which all concern things which perish, perish with the using according to the commandments and doctrines of men. These things indeed have an appearance of wisdom in self-imposed religion, false humility and neglect of body. Here's the verse. But are of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. Did you catch that? They are of no value to the indulgence of the flesh. They appear to have wisdom, 
It looks good. It looks godly. It has no value. Go to Colossians 3, next sentence. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is. Sitting at the right hand of God, set your mind on things above, not on the things of the earth. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. I love the verse that says, it's the glory of kings to search out a matter. That's us. We get to search it out. We get to search it out. It'll energize you. It'll comfort you. It'll make you feel like exactly how you need to on the day that you're reading. So I realize that this might be a heavy word. I can kind of feel it on you guys. But I, I want to I wanna like comfort you in the fact that, that God has made a way, that there is freedom, that it's actually easier to live a life fully submitted, fully life laid down, totally just, God, I'm going to do everything that you tell me to do. It's actually easier to live that life than it is to be halfway in on the fence about a couple of things. Like, why run after him with all your heart and just compromise, like, this one area? What, it's, uh, it, it'll kill you. I want people to be free and happy and joyful and thankful and have something to give, have something to offer. So I want to just encourage you of that this morning, that if there's any, any part of you where it's like you just feel like the Lord is like pricking you, right? And you're like, man, I've been trying to do this in my own strength. We all do it. We all do it sometimes, right? But just put your hand to the plow. Don't look back. Nothing is worth compromising. There is going to be a day where you're going to see him as he is, and you're going to be like, this is worth it. This is totally worth it. It's totally, who cares if your neighbor thinks you're a weirdo? They see you leave on Sunday mornings. They think you're weird. <laughs> right? So we love you. Uh, I'm going to give you an opportunity to come up for prayer. If, if, that, if any part of this is um, like pricking you in any way. Get my notes. There's a whole bunch. Read through 1 Samuel or 1, <laughs> yeah, read through 1 Peter. Look at the life of Saul and just put the lens on. How is, he, how is there fear of man? Because he told you he was and you can see it in the decisions he made and the way that he lived. So let's rise up. Amen. Okay, it is awfully quiet in here, right? Yeah. Okay, so <clears throat> anywho, uh, prayer team, I'm just going to ask you guys to come up. Uh, the rest of you, let's stand. <laughs> let's stand. If any part of this message affected you in any way, I want you to just raise your hand. Because if you can't do it in here, you will absolutely not do it out there. Okay, amen. Cool, I got some people. Y'all are the right people. All right, so I'm just going to pray for you, and then afterwards we'll dismiss. I want to see you Wednesday night at 7, Sunday at 9.30 or 11. Uh, come forward for prayer. We have a prayer team who is praying for you throughout the week. Uh, and so, God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for uh, giving us just the opportunity to see you for who you are, for all of your beauty. Your word says that scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So Lord, I just declare that we are equipped for every good work, God, lacking nothing, fully prepared, fully surrendered. Lord, I just declare that we would be a church who looks more and more like you. And I pray in your everlasting name. Amen. We're so glad you stopped by the website today. We pray the teaching you just listened to impacts you in a way that helps you on your spiritual journey. Please take time to check out the rest of the website. It is full of information about our church, as well as resources to help you in your walk with Christ. If you have not already attended one of our worship services, we hope you make time to visit us in the near future. Everything we do here is designed with you in mind. The Bible says your real life is found in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. All of our activities point to one thing, our mission statement. Real people living real life with a real God who has the answers.